Success is hard. But I have news for you. Having lived in a car for three years, being not successful is hard too. Now here's the difference between the two hards. Being not successful and hard and trying to become successful and hard. When you are not successful and hard, there are no options. You can't decide where you're going to dinner. You can't decide if you're going to buy a pair of shoes. You can't decide if you're going on vacation. You can't decide what you're going to eat. You don't have options. On the road to success, it's hard, but it creates options for you. It does. Look, see, people get hung up on the fact that I'm not a millionaire yet. But hold up, man. There's joy in the journey. See, on your way to becoming a millionaire, how about if you celebrate making $50,000 a year? Don't you remember when you didn't have that? Then when you get $100,000, there's another celebration. Because guess what? It's two times more than 50. You make $150,000, there's another celebration. See, there's joy in the journey. But people people get bogged down with, I ain't a millionaire yet, and they remain unhappy. And now you block all the rest of the blessings God got for you. Because God, the more you're grateful, the more he gives you to be grateful for. So now, God gives you 150, you got your lips stuck out. Why would he give you some more stuff not to be grateful for? A couple of things kept me going. Most of it was messages that I had learned from my mother. But I learned something about faith. Faith comes from hearing, not from having heard. My mother was telling me those messages years ago. But during my homeless years, I would rehear them, and that's when it mattered. And I had this such a grand dream and vision, I was willing to push through to see what the vision was going to be, to see if I could get to the dream. And I kept hearing my mother say words like, God didn't bring you this far to leave you. So I said, okay, well, maybe he ain't left me. Let me just see if I can wake up tomorrow, something change. You know, then I kept hearing stuff like faith is the belief in things that you cannot see. Or say, okay, cool. So I don't see nothing but this homelessness right now, but I think I'm going to make it one day. And I just kept going, man. I just kept. Now, now, now don't get me wrong. There was days I wanted to quit. A lot of days. I almost drove back to Cleveland several times and just gave up. But. You know, man, your dreams have to be bigger than all your fears. If you get, see, that's why you have to have big dreams. Because your dreams have to be bigger than all your fears and all your consequences. What makes people go back is you dream too small. See, your problem in life ain't if you aim too high and you miss it. Your problem in life is if you aim too low and you hit it. That's, you messed up now. So, when you aim a to the moon and you miss, you're still amongst the stars. So it kind of keeps you motivated a lot longer, man, to help you push through. Because everybody's gonna have to have a push through moment. Because everybody has a turn back moment. The key to making it is you can never turn back. See, God is always coming. See, look, man, when you ask God for something, God boxes it up. Put your name on it and he ships it the day you ask for it. Soon as you ask for it, he ships it. The problem with the package is he never tells you the date that it's going to arrive. If he did that, it would destroy the one element that he requires, your faith. So God sends your package, but he only delivers to Faith Street. If you step off of Faith Street and you go over here to I Don't Believe It Boulevard, he don't ship there. If you step over here to I Don't See How Avenue, he don't ship there. 
If you step over here to Ain't No Way Circle, he don't ship there. The package only goes to Faith Street. What happens to the average person is that when the package arrives and you ain't on Faith Street, it's just like the post office and FedEx, UPS. If you ain't there, the package got to go back. You know how many packages you got in heaven with your name on it that got sent back? This is real talk, man. This is, this is how it works. Being successful, y'all, is not a magic trick. You have to learn the principles of success. And you can be successful at anything. You really can, man. I don't have no education. I'm not really like a school smart, none of that. And I got a lot of people who work for me got degrees. See, when I don't, when I don't know something, I, I pay somebody to know it. Just come stand around it. I come down here and do the gifts. I keep telling the jokes. I'm telling you, God has an incredible life for you. All you got to do is ask him for it. Be willing to put in the work. But now this work part is hard. Success is hard. But let me ask you a question. Ain't not being successful hard too? So now which hard you want? You want the hard with some options and some benefits, or you want the hard when ain't nothing going on? I'm gonna take the hard with the option and benefits. Give me that hard. Let me try that. How much time do you have left? When you start thinking about that, we don't know. We don't know. Bobby took all the greatness and all of the talent and all of his abilities to his grave with him. One other thing he could have put in parenthesis under his name, he didn't use all his stuff. And most of, most of us do that. Most of us don't use the stuff that we have brought into the universe. And we want to make a conscious, deliberate, determined effort to start living life with a sense of urgency and using what we've got. Using ourselves up. Sharing what we brought into the universe to share. Because if we don't, nobody else will. Stop wasting valuable time knowing that if we begin to live our lives as if each day were our last, our lives will take on take on a whole new meaning and take on a whole new expression, valuing each moment that we are blessed with. The next thing that begins to nurture that hunger, honor yourself as your word. Don't give your word out lightly. When you throw your word out there and you don't honor it, it makes a statement about you. If you decide to maintain a sense of integrity with yourself, that if I speak it, I'm going to live it. It's who I am. And I'm going to be very cautious in how I give my word to others. And most of all, with the commitments that I make to myself. Because I want my life to reflect my words and honoring who I am and what I express. Another challenging area in terms of nurturing and developing that hunger in yourself is learning the art of becoming single-minded. Learning how to concentrate. Learning how to focus in. And you'll be surprised of the things that you're able to do. When you learn how to block things out, when you learn how to keep thine eyes single, you'll be surprised of the ideas that will come to you, of the people that you'll be able to attract, of the opportunities that you'll be able to see. You begin to see things that have been standing there looking you in the face saying, I can't believe this has been here all this time. I'm nothing no more than you. You know, my job has been exceptional, though. I've been very blessed in that I've lived a life. God has enabled me to pursue my passion and tied it to my gift. I'm gifted at comedy, and I've been able to pursue it. So I wake up every day, and for a living, I play music and tell jokes. How big of a blessing is that? But you know, people, 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 they look at that, 
But, but see, you lose sight of the fact that I'm 54, though. And you, and you don't know the fact that I've been doing this 27 years in order to get to the point where I can wake up and play music and tell jokes for a living. It's like my guest, Tim Gannon, who explained the fact that he wanted to play polo. He didn't buy a pony till he was 40. He saw the first race at 16, the first match at 16. He didn't get that till he was 40. But so people look at him as the owner of the Outback Steakhouse and they go, wow. But they have no idea, no idea the journey and the stress. And, and, and what I want to talk to you about is stress. What stress is, what it really is. How it's necessary if you're planning on getting to where you're trying to go to. See, stress is God's way of training you. It's, pre it's preparation. But what most people do is, see, once you get stressed, you don't want that no more. So now you give up, you through. I'm stressed, so I don't want it. Nobody likes stress. You know, I work with a trainer. I go, I go, I have to work out. You know, 54, I'm supposed to, really, I ain't nothing fly, nothing like that. I, really, I am, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not, you know, you, you've been to your reunion. And you didn't know who was talking to you. Because you was going, whoa. And then, and then you're going to look in the mirror and go, okay, I need to check myself. Do I look that bad? Because some people just let themselves go. But you got to, in order to develop and to change and to grow, stress is necessary. So you got to be willing to go get it every day. There's a story my father told me all the time. Now, I've heard it several different ways, but I'm just telling you the way my daddy gave it to me. He said, son, he said, every morning on the plains of the eastern Serengeti Desert, there arises a gazelle that realizes that he was run faster than the fastest lion, or he will be eaten and he will die that day. On that same desert arises in the morning a lion that realizes that he must run faster than the fastest gazelle or he will starve and he will die that day. He says, son, the moral of the story is, no matter who you is, when you wake up in the morning, you need to be running. No matter, and he says, no matter who you is, this proper grammar is who you are, but my daddy didn't do that and I was comfortable with it. And so what he taught me was a work ethic of, of how to work in order to get to where you want to go. You got to put yourself under some stress, though. See, stress is necessary. God is a trainer. This is what I have learned about it. And all I can tell you is, you know, how I got to be who I am. That's all I can share with you. I got no other stories for you. He got me to this point because from so far from what I done gathered in the process I'm in, he wants me to share my story with those that still trying to get there. And at, and at 40, you can still buy the pony. And by age 50, you can still have five world championships. But you got to be willing to get under some stress. See, stress is necessary. It's like, I, I can't believe what Bishop was talking about because I had prepared this whole thing. And it's just amazing how he is, man. God be doing. See, that's what I've learned. God cold. He do it. He do it. He, he tricky with it. He, he got moves you won't even. He, three of the things I was going to talk about, he talked about. I'm, I, I got scared to talk. Because, you know, I mean, I, who am I? I'm up here, you know, following the greatest preacher of all times with similar subject matter. But I have a different take on it because I had a different walk. So you see, the, the part he was talking about, that seed. See, I'm a seed. I really am. I, see, but a seed has to be planted. A seed got to have dirt put on top of it. If you take a seed and throw it on the concrete and walk off, the sun just burn it up. But guess what? Logically, in my mind, it doesn't make sense 
that to grow something, you should dig a hole, put it down in there, and cover it with dirt. Logically, that don't make no sense to me. But oh, though. See, dirt is necessary for growth and development. Dirt builds character. Dirt, dirt gives you the push-through factor. Dirt makes you come with it when you don't feel like coming with it no more. And you get dirt in a lot of different ways. All of y'all that had dirt thrown on you. And dirt ain't always what you want. It's somebody talking about you down on your job. It's somebody accusing you of something that you didn't do. It's somebody telling you you ain't going to make it. It's somebody sharing information about you that ain't true. That everybody get dirt put on them. But see, when you're getting put under that stress, please know God is always working. Kurt Franklin's song, God is always working. So I smile because I know he back there. See, that dirt builds character in you. When they talking about you, it teaches you to withstand it. Then it gives you something to push through. So when you put the seed and you put the dirt on it, if you understand stress, stress really ain't just dirt. Stress, see, they don't call it dirt when they plant it. They call it soil. Because, see, soil has nutrients in it. What the nutrients, when people talking about you, dogging you, lying on you, backbiting, stealing from you, talking about you, they're actually putting nutrients in you. They're building character. You got character now. So now, and now, the seed, if they put a camera under the ground, you'd have seen the seed sprout open and start coming through the dirt. Because the dirt is necessary so you can prove yourself. You know, if you don't really want to be, everything you see above ground that blossoms and plants and grows and that's beautiful, it was underground one time. All them potatoes, collard greens, they was underground one time. Them apple trees, they was underground one time. So they had to prove themselves. See, you want to be successful, well then you got to prove yourself. You got to push through the dirt. You got to come up through here. You got to come out, then you sprout, and then Bishop say, then you become a tree. Next thing you know, you got fruit. So when you under stress, take the stress for what it is. Don't get fooled. Don't just think, oh, well, man, Lord must not mean for it to be. What you tripping for? What you talking about? How you think you're going to be a plant, a tree, a flower, a bush, and ain't no stress? How you gonna get to be that without no dirt? Didn't they do Jesus? How you figure you supposed to get up out of here? He was pretty perfect. We ain't even perfect. See, I expect dirt now. I expect people to talk about me. Matter of fact, I look forward to it now. Do your thing, because if I can weather what happened to me and my family earlier, you can bring whatever you got now. There's some more stuff going around now that's about to happen. Bring it. Because now I have developed a character that is stress. Here's a habit that I do. Maybe it might be of some value to you. I get up in the morning and I start writing what great ideas that I can think of today that can improve me and that will enable me to reach my goal. And I just let my mind flow. Sometimes I write 15, 20 ideas. Some days it's more difficult than others. One idea can change your life. One idea can turn your life around. Deciding that you're going to focus to develop your skills. The guy was, was um, the new owner of a team. A team, a baseball team that was in the basement of the league when he took it over. He went to the pitcher and he said, what is your best throw? And he said, well, I got a good curveball and I've got a good fastball. And he went on talking about his different throws. He said, but tell me this, what is your best throw? He thought for a moment. He said, I've got a good fastball. He said, that's all I want you to work on. Nothing else. Just develop your fastball. The next year, they went to the World Series. Most people don't know where their fastball is. Most people go through life never discovering what their talents are. Most people never develop their talents. 
They have skills and abilities, but if you don't nurture them, if you don't develop them, they will never serve you. Your gifts can take you many places if you develop your gifts. True leadership is when a leader takes other followers and makes them leaders. That's true leadership. So when your message has to stay, has to stay consistent, I have a duty. The first thing we must know is our why. Why? Because I am a child of the God. Stop right there. My how and my what are the tangible things that gets me to those places. But when you talk about why the message has to be consistent, because the right people connecting to the right message right time and that's where a lot of kids definitely in today's time their instant gratification comes from so social media comes from Instagram comes from all of these different things but me and you're old enough none of that didn't exist right. so who did we have to lean on it was a foundation and so that foundation is what I believe why kids struggle so much these days not just kids because the foundation of what I've always understood is what I've always exercised my whole life since I was a junior deacon in the church since 10 right right you ever went to church sometimes right and you ain't been in a while and then you go back and as soon as you get in there the first paragraph sounds like the pastor's talking directly to you but I mean do he know my business yeah but all it is is just confirming the disconnect yeah and he's talking I, through absolutely right, through. absolutely man look we we have we have a real duty, and I'm telling you this, like this is where I, why I'm so inspired to change one life a day. Maybe I change more, but one life a day, why? Kid called me last night. Papa, I'm really frustrated going through this. I sent him this information. He has, uh, he has cancer with some stuff, dealing with some stuff. He came back, he was like, I never knew that, that I had the choice to live. I said, absolutely you have the choice, but Watch what happens, and I'm gonna use the analogy of animals, right? Why is a lion the king of the jungle? He's not the biggest, he's not the strongest, he's not the fastest. The only thing that sets a lion different than an elephant is his mentality. That's it. I, when he walks up, he must be respected, period. An elephant weighs 50 times more than this lion. So why wouldn't the elephant look at the lion and say, mentality. If an eagle flies at a certain altitude, if he bumps into another bird up there, it must be another eagle. Cause pigeons don't fly that altitude. They can. They can, but they don't. And so that's where we have to really understand what life really is. Life is really being that leader that inspires other followers to become leaders, not follow. The only reason eagles fly alone, this is why eagles don't flock. You rarely see an eagle with other eagles. They don't want to be affected by the perspective. By other people's perspective. My man, when I was 23 and I would like see some of my high school friends for like football during Thanksgiving and they all looked at me like, oh, you work at your dad's liquor store? My man, the, the, the chemicals in my body, I, I love it. The adversity, the negative, is the advantage. Mm -hmm. People fear losing. And when you're losing from the get, <laughs> when you start off losing, you don't fear losing, you just convince yourself the game is rigged and you start dwelling. If I can get you to stop dwelling, and if I can get you to stop fearing losing, then you're off to the races. I leave money on the table every day. I can Tony Robbins and Oprah this shit to the fucking end of life. I'm just not interested. I'm interested in doing me, documenting what I'm doing, putting out content, and if you happen to pick up on that, Got you're it. pumped and you wanna email me and say, you know, I was this and now I'm that, that's a high that nobody can ever understand, but I don't wanna do that full time. I don't care what your point of view is. I don't, I went to Mount Ida College, 95% minority kids. I went to the mall seven times in the first 14 days that I went to Mount Ida College. I got pulled over four times. You know why? Because the other three kids in the car with me were black. 
I'm like, unless you live that, you can't understand that. And I didn't live it, I lived it, I was close to it, but I'm still not it. But like, you can't, don't sit somewhere where you've never interacted with a culture and judge. You don't know what you're talking about. In the same way in reverse. Like when I t- I'm on shows like this or when I talk to homies or when I'm talking to the culture and I'm like, yo, I got friends who have $10 million in the bank, trust fund babies who are more miserable than you. They're like, get the hell out of here. I'm like, you have no empathy. That sounds good. Right. What do you think it feels like when you've lost before you started? Because no matter what you accomplish, everybody's gonna be like, your daddy put you on. You suck. Michael Jackson. Like what world, like I know that like it feels bad and there's all these things. It's better in life than ever now. Not because we're better as people, but because the internet is decentralizing the world. All this cryptocurrency, Bitcoin stuff, everybody's in the craze, they're not being thoughtful. It's not about Bitcoin, it's about blockchain and what that technology means, which is means you and I, I can sell you my home, one quick transaction on the blockchain, we both trust it, it's good, and none of the banks and all these people get their hands in our business. Right. Like shit's going down. So go get yours. Like like stop telling me you're gonna or stop telling me like you got held back. If you have a smartphone and guess what all of you do. Well then you have a studio in your pocket. If you're so good, spit your run. Do I have to tell you about all the people that went and did car studio videos and put it on Instagram and are popping? Like stop bullshitting. Now there's no more excuses. Here's what's going to happen over the next 100 years and I'm glad I'm putting it on film and audio right now cuz Either maybe I'll be alive because technology is changing or my great grandkids are gonna be proud of me. We're about to go through the craziest hundred year of human beings. We're gonna take one big step backwards. We're in the beginning stages. I think we're gonna have a 10, 12 year of tension about all this shit. Right? This is not, by the way, this is not going away tomorrow. You have to understand what's gonna happen. Everybody's gonna get called to the mat. And then what people are gonna realize over the next 20, 30 years is like, wait a minute, everybody's flawed on something. Who's perfect? There's not a person in this room that doesn't do something that all the rest of us would judge as a real bad thing. It's just the way it is. So it's gonna take us 40 years to get there. But once we do, people are gonna be like, okay, wait a minute, we need to reset. Like if everybody's got something, we need to react appropriately to that something. We need to have different conversations. Like the way we treat alcoholism today or depression today, the way we didn't 30 or 40 years ago, right? That scarlet letter, is gonna change and what's gonna happen is we're gonna live totally different lives. We're gonna be far more acceptant of shortcomings over time because the hypocrisy is gonna be out the bag. Because if I ever think Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama or George Bush or Donald Trump has any impact on me, I'm a fucking loser. It is inherent in the nature of physical existence of life forms that challenges are an essential ingredient of their lifespan here and part of the way through which they evolve. But when they say they evolve, it means it's the one consciousness evolves, awakens into this dimension through the different life forms in different ways. And it awakens only because we are being challenged and that's already, that is a, quite a relief to realize to be challenged doesn't mean there's something wrong. <laughs> there's something wrong with my life that shouldn't be. If you believe or act as if this shouldn't be happening, then you get really unhappy. Then the challenges become transformed into unhappiness inside you. If it's not unhappiness, it's resentment. If it's not resentment, it's, it's anger, it's self-pity, it's complaining, it's despondency. <laughs> so, so for the simple reason that you are misunderstanding the very purpose of life and expecting something that your mind has come up with, it should be different. Some people are afraid of not succeeding in whatever they do because they have a self, they, they, their self-image, which is derived from thinking, uh, would suffer. If I fail at something, then I will, my self-image will be injured and therefore I'm not even going to try. And again, that's to do with deriving your identity from thinking. And even the thought, I have failed, is a lie. I am a failure is an even greater lie. 
you have not failed. You can simply reinterpret and say, I have learned something here. This is not for me, for example. So, but why believe the lies that your mind produces? So, as you know, people, many people live with a very hostile mind. Uh, but those people are, the motivation, their motivation would probably be very great, I would hope, to get out of their minds. But first they need to realize that their problems are self-generated, mind-generated. Studies show that your attitude can have a greater impact on your success than your IQ. You can be extremely talented, have incredible potential, but if you don't have the right attitude, it will keep you from rising higher. And we spend all kinds of time and money making sure the outside looks good. Eating right, working out, wearing the latest fashions, and that's all fine, but too often we're not spending any time on the inside. Nice clothes won't cover up a bad attitude. A pretty face, perfect makeup, won't hide being bitter on the inside. If you stay positive in a negative situation, you win. Why exactly are you winning? You're winning the war against negativity. You're winning the war against despair. You're winning the war against stress. And you know, negativity, it is a sneaky little bastard. Let me tell you something. Because it sort of creeps into your life, it creeps into your mind, it creeps into your skin and into your blood pressure. And before you even realize it, you started to succumb to it. And how do you know that you are succumbing to negativity? Well, first of all, it depletes you. It, it, it has a heaviness to it. It has an intensity to it. And when you succumb to negativity, it changes your character. You snap at your kids, you snap at your teammates, you feel stuck, you feel on edge, you feel tense. And that's why I want to talk to you about the power of your attitude right now. Because your brain is a pattern recognizing machine. And when you succumb to negativity, whether you think you're doing it or not, your brain will automatically start to see more negativity and feel more negativity, which is why it's so easy to get stuck ruminating and worrying and in this sort of loop that you can't get out of. Now, why do you want to build a positive attitude as a habit right now? Well, first of all, because a positive, powerful attitude is infectious. It inspires other people. It makes you resilient. And from a mindset perspective, it will help you spot more positive things. What positive things could you spot? You can spot opportunities. You can spot solutions to the problems that you're feeling. You can spot problem solving strategies. You can spot ways to connect. You can spot ways to be more innovative. And so positive attitude reads more positivity. That's why I want to teach you how to do it, because it's a strategy. Did you hear that word? So a powerful, positive attitude is not only a habit I want you to develop, but it is a strategy. And you're deploying other strategies right now to make you strong and to make you safe. You're washing your hands, you're getting supplies, you're editing your news intake, you're connecting with friends, developing the habit of a powerful attitude is a strategy. And when you practice having a powerful attitude, what happens is it becomes a habit. What's a habit? It's just a pattern that you repeat. So instead of succumbing to negativity, which can become its own habit, your powerful attitude becomes a habit. And look, I'm not talking about like saccharine, stupid, unrealistic, throw caution to the wind, let's just be positive, I'm positive I'm not going to get this, I'm positive I should go on spring break because I'm not at risk, I'm positive that I don't have to worry about that, that's not positivity, that's stupidity, okay? What I'm talking about is the kind of powerful attitude where you are able to see opportunity in any moment, where you are able to keep your wits about you in any moment, 
where you are able to have an attitude about what you're facing that keeps you strong and keeps you in control that your attitude day to day is keeping you anchored. So even when the headlines come in, if you happen to see them and they wig you out and you feel yourself succumbing, you can go right back to boom, having a powerful attitude. A bad attitude makes you unattractive. It overrides what's on the outside. It's important to look good, to develop your skills, to get an education, but it's even more important to keep a good attitude. Nobody wants to be around a sour, critical, condescending person. Colossians 3, in the message translation says, Dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you. Kindness, compassion, and humility. As parents, sometimes we pick out clothes for our children to wear. Our Heavenly Father has picked out something for us all to wear. Kindness, being good to people, being pleasant to be around. When you're kind, you draw people to you. When you're good-natured, friendly, opportunity will come your way. People want to do business with people that they like. When we're hiring someone, their resume tells us what they can do, what their skills are, but we always meet with them to see what their attitude is. Are they positive? Are they friendly, kind, considerate? We can find someone else with the same skills. The real question is, do they have the attitude that's going to take us higher? They may be gifted, but a negative attitude will pull the team down. Your attitude is going to determine your altitude. It will determine how high or how low you go. Well, Joel, I've always been kind of negative, critical, condescending. That's just who I am. No, that's who you're choosing to be. That's not who you are. That may be how you were raised. That's what you saw growing up. But that's not how you have to stay. Try being kind, friendly, good natured. You'll not only enjoy life more, but you'll go further. If you have a nose high attitude, if you're positive, you see the best, you're kind to people, you have a smile, because you're nose high, you're going to continue to rise higher. You're going to see God's blessings and faith. But if you're sour, hard to get along with, you don't want to go to work, bitter over disappointments, because you have a nose down attitude, your life is going to go that direction. And sometimes we're discouraged over what we brought on ourselves. It's not the enemy, it's our attitude. The good news is, all you have to do is make an attitude adjustment. It's not complicated. You can't change other people. You can't change how you were raised. A lot in life we can't control. But one thing we can all control is our attitude. Am I going to live this day negative? sour, seeing the wrong, chip on my shoulder, or am I going to live it in faith, positive, hopeful, seeing the best, being good to people? This is a choice that we have to make every day. If you're going to have a good attitude, you have to do it on purpose because there will be all kinds of negative things that try to creep in. Bitterness, discouragement, self-pity. If you're not proactive, if you don't choose the right attitude, then the wrong attitude will show up. I wonder what would happen in your life if you would make a small tweak. Instead of going to work sour, dreading the day, feeling unappreciated, you would show up with a smile, grateful to have the job, knowing that you're not working under people, you're working under God, that He's keeping the records. That's what allows God to change things. What would happen in your marriage, your relationships, if you'd make a small attitude adjustment? Instead of being contentious, hard to get along with, you'd start being friendly, loving, respectful. Instead of saying harsh, critical words, you'd start giving compliments, telling your spouse how much you love them, 
how blessed you are to have them in your life. Just a small adjustment. Getting your attitude a little higher, watch those relationships begin to improve. Or maybe you've had bad breaks. Life hasn't treated you fair. It's easy to get sour, go around with a chip on our shoulder, focus on what's wrong. That's a nose down attitude. You're choosing the direction you're going to go. Why don't you tilt it a little nose high? Yes, it was unfair, but I know God is my vindicator. I know God is fighting my battles. God promised to pay me back double for the unfair things that have happened. You keep that up and you'll see God make up for the wrongs. Diseases of attitude. There's a lot of things that can wreck your chances to do well. We live in a rather dangerous world, so you got to be not only wise, you got to be careful. Now, attitude diseases are just as bad as physical diseases, right? High blood pressure, heart trouble. I mean, a lot of things lace your chances to do well. So you've got to be careful. And attitude diseases are deadly. I mean, they'll destroy all the good things you start. So we'll go through those attitude diseases, how to spot them, how to look for them, what they are, and, and the cure. And I'm a pro on these because I've had them all, so I can give you excellent advice on these. Now, the last subject we're going to consider tonight is called the day that turns your life around. And under this subject, we're going to talk about the emotions that can change your life. Human beings are emotional creatures, and emotions are powerful for life change. Now, of course, emotions are so powerful, they can go either way on you. Emotions can either build or destroy. So you really have to employ emotions properly. We call civilization the intelligent management of human emotions. If you can intelligently apply your emotions in the right direction, no telling what can happen. Could turn your life around one day would be sufficient. So we'll talk about those. Okay. Now that's a lot to cover in one evening, but uh, we'll keep at it here and see if we can't get it all done. I'd like to have you now jot down the theme of the seminar. Every seminar should have a theme, I guess. We've got one. It's on some of our literature if you happen to notice it, but if you didn't, for your notes, here it is. The theme of the seminar. That's the theme of our seminar tonight. The major key to your better future is you. And I'd like to have you underline two words just to give it some added punch. Underline the word major and the word you so that it reads, the major key to your better future is you. Now, my first suggestion is transfer this to a card or something where you can put it up, where you can see it every day. Preferably put it up where you can see it at the beginning of the day before you go off to put the day together This is a good phrase just to glance at to keep in mind as you're putting the day together. It's called the silent seminar If you'll just let this talk to you during the day I found it to be tremendously helpful the major key to your better future is you for a big share of my life now I didn't have uh, this one quite figured out among a lot of things I didn't have quite figured out Many things used to puzzle me back in those early days. I used to wonder why two people could work for the same company, one make twice as much money. Now see, that used to puzzle me. And maybe they were the same age, graduated from the same school, live in the same community, work for the same company, with the same products and the same services. They've got the same traffic, the same problems, and one makes a thousand a month, the other one makes two thousand a month. Now that was my puzzling question. Why would this long list be the same and the money twice as much? Perhaps there's another way that you could look at the world and a number, another way that you could act in the world. So what it would reflect back to you would be much better than what it reflects back to you now. And then the second part of that is, well, imagine that many people did that because we've done a lot as human beings. We've done a lot of remarkable things. And I've told you already, I think before that today, for example, about 250,000 people will be lifted out of abject poverty and about 300,000 people attached to the electrical power grid. We're making people, we're lifting people out of poverty collectively at a faster rate that's ever occurred in the history of humankind by a huge margin. And that's been going on unbelievably quickly since the year 2000. The UN had pl planned to have poverty between 2000 and 2015, and it was accomplished by 2013. So there's inequality developing in many places, and you hear lots of political agitation about that. But overall, the, the tide is lifting everyone up, and that's a great thing. And we have no idea how fast we can multiply that if people got their act together and really aimed at it. Because, you know, my, my experience is with people that we're probably running at about 51% of our capacity. Something, I mean, you can think about this yourselves. I often ask undergraduates how many hours a day you waste or how many hours a week you waste. And the classic answer is something like four to six hours a day. You know, inefficient studying, uh, watching things on YouTube that not only do you not want to watch, that you don't even care about, that make you feel horrible about watching after you're done, that's probably four hours right there. Now, you think, well, that's, 
20, 25 hours a week, it's 100 hours a month, that's two and a half full work weeks. It's half a year of work weeks per year. And if your time is worth $20 an hour, which is a radical underestimate, it's probably more like 50, if you think about it in terms of deferred wages. If you're wasting 20 hours a week, you're wasting $50,000 a year. And you are doing that right now. And it's because you're young, wasting $50,000 a year is a way bigger catastrophe than it would be for me to waste it because I'm not gonna last nearly as long. And so if your life isn't everything it could be, you could ask yourself, well, what would happen if you just stopped wasting the opportunities that are in front of you? You'd be, who knows how much more efficient, 10 times more efficient, 20 times more efficient. That's the Pareto distribution. You have no idea how efficient, efficient people get. It's completely, it's off the charts. Well, and if we all got our act together collectively and stopped making things worse, because that's another thing people do all the time, not only do they not do what they should to make things better, they actively attempt to make things worse because they're spiteful or resentful or arrogant or deceitful or, or homicidal or genocidal or all of those things all bundled together in an absolutely pathological package. If people stopped really, really trying just to make things worse, we have no idea how much better they would get just because of that. So there's this weird dynamic that's part of the existential system of ideas between human vulnerability, social judgment, both of which are, 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 are major causes of suffering, and the failure of individuals to adopt the responsibility that they know they should adopt. And that's the thing that's interesting too, is that, and like one of the, another thing I've often asked my undergraduate classes is, you know, there's this idea that, that people have, that people have a conscience. And you know what the conscience is. It's, it's this feeling or voice you have in your head just before you do something that you know is stupid, telling you that probably you shouldn't do that stupid thing. Right, but I want you to do me a favor. Like, don't let life do you like that. Like, don't let life put you in a circumstance or a situation where you stop dreaming. Like, don't let life put you in a situation where you are helping somebody else make their dreams become a reality you forgot you have your, your own. Like, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't get so caught up giving some job 30, 40, 50, 60 hours of your day that you don't have any time left for yourself. And so do me a favor, I don't, I don't want reality right now. I'm not interested in how much your student loans are. I'm not interested. Because your student loans are sucking your dream. I'm not interested right now. And I got a divorce and right now I just can't. I'm not, I'm not interested. Eric, I lost a child and you don't know what it's like to. I'm not, I'm not interested in your reality right now. I, I, will, I want you to get back to your dreams. I want you to get back to your goals because no matter what has happened in life, you've got another 30 years, another 40 years, another 50 years, like you can't get stuck on, like you can't let that thing that devastated you in 1989, the thing that devastated you in uh, 1996, 2001, like you can't wake up every day to 2001. 2001 was a tragedy, yes it was, but you can't stay there. Look, look, I want you to look at your goals and I want you to ask yourself this question. Do you know what it takes to make that happen? Literally, like, because this is all it's going to take. Three things, it's all it's going to take. Do you know what it takes? And you guys have an advantage because you've been at this conference, I think, three days, you got a whole bunch of information. Look, the only thing it takes to go from where I went to, a homeless, high school dropout, sleeping in abandoned buildings, eating out of trash cans. I went from being a high school dropout, getting a GED to having a PhD. Listen to me, the only thing it takes is knowing what it takes. So one day I woke up and was like, okay, E, stop talking about what you don't have. You need to know what you don't know so you can get to where you're trying to get to. So being successful is not who you are, it's what you know. So I need to get a different relationship to knowledge. So I'm hyped, but I did not come here just so you can get pumped up or get hyped. You have been given information. You are, you are this close to making every dream you wrote down happen. Why? Because you have been taught by the best of the best. You have been taught by the best of the best. You've been taught by people who've been doing this for years. You've been taught by people who love you and care for you. People who are giving you information that you're not going to get randomly on your own. And so you are this close to your dreams and goals. So I, I have to ask you the question. You have the information. Now what are you going to do with it?